A warm welcome to our Zoom webinar organized by GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. Before going to the today's session, I have a delighted announcement to be made. From today, each participants of this webinar will be receiving an e-certificate for the participation. And please stay with us until the end of this session and we will be releasing the link in the chat box. Now, we are moving to today's topic, Diagnosis of Parkinsonism and Principles of Management. Kindly mute your microphone and turn off the camera during the presentation and use the chat box to clear your doubts. Now, it's my utmost pleasure to introduce Dr. Darshana Sirisena, consultant neurologist currently attached to the Kalamu North Teaching Hospital, Ragama. He is also the President-Elect Association of Sri Lankan Neurologists. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Good morning. And at the outset, I should thank all the organizers, organizers of this uh, CPD session for inviting me for me to give this lecture. I hope you can see the, the screen. So today's topic is diagnosis of Parkinsonism and principles of management. So at the outset, I'm going to show you a video and just for you to make your interest. So just see whether you can see whether this patient has Parkinson's or not, right? Just keep it on mind. <clears throat> Okay, good. So what you are want to know is whether you just go through this the video. If you want, I'll play it again and see whether you can die. You have to decide whether this patient has Parkinsonism or not. That is number one. If you think this patient has Parkinsonism, on what grounds you make the diagnosis? Secondly, if not, if you think this patient doesn't have Parkinson, on what grounds you don't think so? Right? Just one more, once more. I'm showing some physical signs here. Okay, thanks. So today's topic, I'm going to uh, concentrate on three areas. I will first give an introduction. Secondly, I will the, the first part of my talk will be on diagnosis of Parkinsonism. Thirdly, I will mainly concentrate on the management of principles because I'm just touching on the management principle because if not, the management is an entire 30 to 45 minutes topic. So this is the second commonest degenerative neurological disorder we encounter. You know what when it comes to the etiologies of conditions, there are infections, there are inflammatory conditions, there are tumors. So there, as well as there is what we call neurodegenerative. Degenerative simply means with the age, as we all know, there are certain amount of cells in our brain uh, losses its function. So in certain patients, the, this uh, loss is accelerated and they have symptoms which is due to the loss of brain cells. So that is what we call as neurodegenerative conditions. When it comes to the commonest neurodegenerative condition is Alzheimer's disease. This is the second commonest. So if you take the prevalence of uh, Parkinsonism is around 1%. So you know in this country, we have around uh, 20 to 22 million population. So we usually see, should see about 220,000 patients. So, but that is not the issue. The WFN means the World Federation of Neurology. Last year in their World Brain Day campaign, gave uh, the, the prevalence to the Parkinson's and they predicted in five years time, that is in 2025, right? In five years time, this number is going to be double. So we are usually, the, the, the current number is going to get double. So this condition mainly affects elderly, but that is elderly in the sense, it's after the 50 years of age, not keeping with the, 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 the current trends of classification of young and old, right? But it's what we call, it is more common in the 50 years of more. But having said it, we have we at the present we see a lot of patients with Parkinsonism current coming around 35 to 50 as well. So that's what I want to admit here. It's not an uncommon in young patients as well. So this condition was first described 204 years ago by Dr. James Parkinson. Actually, this condition uh, is named currently under his name after uh, the French neurologist Charcot named this condition and uh, gave the full credit to him and named it the Parkinson's. So according to uh, this essay that he wrote in the, 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 the British Journal, 
so even today if you see if you see in your uh, right hand side if you can see the the one of the pages he described this condition he says involuntary tremulousness with lessened muscle power in parts not in action so that means a tremor as you all know there is tremor associated which is rest and with a propensity to bend the trunk forward you know if you have seen a parkinson's patient they have very stoop posture so that is what he describes and uh, from walking to running pace and sense and intellect should be uninjured. That means the patients, the, uh, the, the memory and other things not important, which is not true. But even this 204 years ago, according to his history, majority of his features are still valid. So this is the, 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 the pathophysiology of, uh, there is a deposition of Lewy bodies in area called uh, basal ganglia. You know what it means. Basal ganglia is the part which is responsible for producing uh, dopamine. Dopamine is very much responsible for our many of many functions in our system, but mostly when it comes to the neurology, the muscle movements and the, to keep the muscle movements and the coordination. So what happens here for some reason, which we don't know still, the Lewy bodies get deposited in the area of this basal ganglia and this, uh, the, the cells are destructed a little prematurely. For an example, if a 60 year old patient has uh, not Parkinson, this is, if you can see the picture here, their basal ganglia area is very much, uh, Markedly, there are sufficient cells, but this pigmentation is much preserved. When you do a Parkinson's patient, you can see there is not much cells for some reason, which we don't know still. The Lewy body deposition causes destruction of the basal ganglia cell. As a result, there is uh, not sufficient amount of basal ganglia cell which can reduce, which can produce the dopamine. So the important thing is severity is directly severity is directly related to the nigrostriatal lesser nigrostriatal in the other word means a part of the basal ganglia, which is about ten times when compared to normal. For that's what I told. If if you take a sixty year old patient, if a patient's uh, Parkinson's patient cell loss is about ten times more than a normal person who doesn't have Parkinson's. So when when does the cell uh, the 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 symptoms come it's about they have found about 30 percent of cells should be lost at a time the first motor symptom to be diagnosed but the important thing is here next five years when you have started the when have, uh, you got this uh, the condition in next five years then another 50 percent of the cells will be lost and the disease gets progress so now they have again found there is a, this cell loss actually begins five to ten years before the first motor symptom appears. So that's what we call a pre-symptomatic stage. We are, the, the lot of research has been done to find any tool, I will come to in the next couple of slides, to find a uh, test which if we can find a person before developing the symptoms. Unfortunately, we haven't got, succeeded in that area. So this is why it's told. So person gets, see here the, the arrow indicates in that they are of age of 50 years, this is zero. Yeah, the patient is first diagnosed of Parkinson's at this age. What they say, actually the disease starts very well before about uh, at minimum of 10 years, they actually say about 20 years because at the age of 30. But during this period that is called pre-symptomatic stage, you couldn't diagnose because there is no any tool. But here is the main important thing, the other patient appears with symptoms and thereafter, with the time, patients, if the patient lives for about 20 years, their disease progresses, which is called from the mild to mild, mild disease to they progress to moderate to severe disease. So the key is here, unfortunately, if you don't know, this is the one of the important objective of this talk to diagnose some patients with Parkinson's very early stage. Why I am saying so, if you diagnose the patients at the very early stage, you can manage them very well. Their quality of life can be improved as a normal person. So unfortunately, what is happening today, we wait till until the patients get moderate to severe disease, which should not happen. If that is why I want to stress the importance of this talk, how to diagnose this one, this one. So the important message I want to give you, this manage diagnosis of Parkinson's entirely clinical. You don't need to have any investigation. If, a, if you are a doctor, if you are a medical officer, if you are a registrar, anyone who is in Kartankot uh, should be able to diagnose as well as National Hospital because there is no need of any investigation. This is a entirely clinical where you should know the uh, the what uh, what are the diagnostic features so for that there are various guidelines exist as i mentioned before the most important is to diagnose early early mild stages so what is parkinsonism it's a condition it's a neurological syndrome as you all know where manifested by a combination of clinical signs 
So what are they? These signs are independent. That means sign A should not be there to have B, right? So those are completely independent. They are not overlapping with each other. And importantly, all these deals with the motor function of the things, that is the movements of the patient. So all these are, again, it's a neurological syndrome, which is manifested by any combination of independent, non-overlapping cardinal motor features. What are they? The first thing called tremor, tremor at rest. So, you know, if you, if you know, Tremor could be defined into two, uh, classified into two. One thing is a tremor at rest, the other one is tremor at action. So this is predominantly tremor at rest. So second feature is what we call as rigidity. Rigidity doesn't mean spasticity, it's a totally different thing. So rigidity is, as you know, when you move around the joint passively, you can feel some resistance that is called rigidity. This is extra pyramidal, what we call as a cogwheel rigidity. Third feature is echinacea or bradykinacea. I would like to use the most correct term would be bradykinacea. So, you know, kinacea means movements. Brad is slow. So, the term would be slowness of movements. So, sometimes very advanced disease, they have echinacea as well. The fourth feature, they say, postural instability. How do you know postural instability? They have frequent falls. So, that is or difficulty in walking. So, this is these are the four clinical features a Parkinson's system consists of. What are they? Tremor at rest rigidity, echinacea or bradykinacea and postural instability. So it's a nice mnemonic you can remember, TRAP. T stands for tremor, R for rigidity, A for echinacea and P for postural instability. So I'm going to show all the clinical signs now. This is the first clinical sign, the tremor at rest. I hope you can see. So see the patient's right hand. So patient has a involuntary tremulous or what we call as oscillatory movement around the uh, at the wrist, as you saw very clearly, it was the patient first when resting his hand on the lap. But now when patient's posture is initiated, the patient holds his hands against his gravity, it is not there. That's the predominantly of a postural hand, so rest tremor. So this is not, this is completely eliminated when the patient's uh, holds his hands against his gravity. So, but in some patients, especially in advance, they have a postural component as well. So next feature is what, sorry, next feature is what we call as bradykinesia. Look at the patient's uh, right hand, right? He has a tremor as you saw. So see when this, the patient tries to open and close his fist, what happens? Very slow. Just check in with you. If you don't have Parkinson's, just check it. It's not very slow. This is called finger taps, right? Finger taps is it, with the thumb and index finger tap, try to check. On the left hand, it's again slow. Can you see this is not the normal movements, right? and this is alternating pronation and supination. So there are three maneuvers we can do in upper limb to check the bradykinesia. Simply all these movements are what we call as repetitive alternative movements. There are three things if you can go through the video again. One thing is it called opening and closing, right? That's what he does, opening and closing as you go. The, as the, the, the movement goes off, the patient's velocity and the amplitude reduces. And the other maneuver is called the finger tapping. So with the index and the, the Thumb, he tries to tap as fast as possible in Parkinson's, which is very slow. And the third menu is called as cartesias is pronation and supination, that is also slow. They start a little bit fast, but as the time goes, it becomes slow. This is bradykinesia. This is how you check the, the, the rigidity. As you know, the rigidity cannot be explained by a video, but these of you perform. You just passively move around the joint and you will feel the cockwheel type of rigidity. So that is something you have to feel. This is how you perform, right? So if you suspect a patient of, this is how you do it. The next is what we call as the postural insight. Look at this patient's gait. So see what works. The patient doesn't move, uh, swing his arms when you walk and see what happens when the patient trying to turn. So he's like blocked or what we call as frozen or freezed. So this is called freezing of gait or what we call as hesitancy. Hesitancy is when the patient want to turn, they can't turn as a normal person. Look at this video again. So this is when the arm swinging is lost and when he wants to turn, this is not a like a block is turning, right? Somewhere. Sorry, like a robot is turning, not a normal person turns. This is what we call as freezing of gait or turn hesitancy, right? So this is the next one. So this is a full picture of the stoop posture. I saw the patient has trim, very stoop posture. That's what I told and sees what happens to when the patient wants to turn. 
so very difficult to turn right like it's called freezing of gate or the other word in specifically this is turn hesitancy so when the patient wants to turn it's very difficult disease so this is this is what the postural instability means right fortunately this doesn't come with a very early stage of idiopathic parkinson's Okay, we'll go to the. When you want to confirm in your clinic setting whether the person has postural instability, this is what we do. So, so the registrars is very important. This comes as OSCEs as times, right? So, in a so this is what we call as pull test. Pull test is how do you check the patient's balance or the 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 the, the risk of falling. This pull test, how you do? Ask the patient to stand up and keep the patient's feet little apart, and you behind the examiner behind the behind and. Try to uh, pull from the shoulders. Explain what for the patient and check whether and ask the patient if the patient want to improve or the patient want, what the patient task is not to fall, and ask them if he want he can keep couple of steps backwards to prevent from falling. So see what I am doing. So I explain then. I told him as you know he's a Parkinson tremor. You can see. I give a small pull. So now he says he. Again, give a little bit more power, right? So the patient actually here the pull test is negative because patient improves or the patient uh, recovers within couple of steps keeping behind. If the patient can improve with two minimum of two steps, I'm sorry, maximum of two steps, the patient can wait without falling. The pull test is called checking the retropulsion. So again, I'll show you because the importance of this comes in our case at times. It's called retropulsion or pull test. Patient recovers within couple of steps. He doesn't fall. Good feel more. That's right. So the, now the golden question is pre-symptomatic diagnosis and biomarkers. As I told, the, if the, before the first symptom appears, the brain changes had started. That is what they have found. The most important challenge is at the PD research at the moment to identify an individual who at risk of PD. If such, they can start some management. They can make some modification to uh, the, 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 far, the slow down the illness. You see, unfortunately, we haven't found. As you know, if I give an example, you know, uh, diabetic patients. There are certain things called pre-diabetic stage with blood sugars and other tests. You can see, but here they have tried so many biomarkers. They have started clinical biomarkers, all factor testing, G genetic testing, CSF biomarkers. But unfortunately, so far we haven't found any test. But there is some promising evidence. Impaired olfaction is one of the earliest signs of Parkinson's disease. They are trying to have a lot of tests on death. Nothing is validated so far. So the message here, there is no tool or investigation to diagnose at pre symptomatic stage at the moment. So now we'll come to the causes of Parkinson's. Now you know how to diagnose Parkinsonism. The next important thing, causes of Parkinsonism. It is very simple. There are four causes only. First and most important thing or the commonest thing I would say, the primary or what we call as idiopathic Parkinson's disease, IPD. Second thing is secondary, you know, this is something to do with the dopamine, uh, dopamine uh, release in this condition, as you know, the pathophysiology. So secondary is drug, the common is drug induced, you know, our psychiatrist colleagues are the commonest responsible, the commonest culprits, because they use a lot of dopamine drug, dopamine blocking drug. Because of that, a lot of uh, some uh, psychiatric patients in long run with antipsychotics develop Parkinsonism. So it is a secondary cause. That means there is a cause that you can identify. Third variety is the third type of the Parkinsonism, what we call as atypical Parkinson's disease or what we call as Parkinson's plus. There are four conditions specially coming under. There are a lot. I'll discuss in a couple of slides. Right, right. The final thing is what we call as genetic or heritable degenerative. As you know, there is par genetic park, young onset Parkinson, there is genetic related. And the most commonest condition we should not miss in a heritable degenerative condition is the Wilson's disease, where the patient comes with Parkinsonism features. So, again, if you find the causes of Parkinsonism, it comes under these four broad categories the primary or the idiopathic Parkinson's disease, the secondary, commonest is the drug induced or what we call antipsychotic induced. Atypical Parkinson's disease or the Parkinson's plus, and finally the genetic or the heredity. So now I will come to the how to diagnose idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is the commonest out of that four. 
So this is, there is a guideline called, there are a couple of guidelines, actually I'm going to discuss two. The United Kingdom Parkinson's Disease Society Brain Bank Criteria, I'll mention what this, how this criteria initiated. In the brain, what we call, in the, in the, the, the United Kingdom, this is called Queen's College, University of College London, they have a brain bank. What they say is, they, uh, after the patient dies, they collect the brains and dissect. You know how to diagnose Parkinson's, the gold standard is, you have to find, uh, found uh, Lewy bodies in the thing. So what they say, they took, for an example, they took 100 patients with Parkinson's, suspected Parkinson's, and they uh, did a post-mortem on the brain and uh, as a gold standard, they found to have, uh, they, they've tried to found, find whether there is the, the Lewy bodies. If the Lewy bodies are there, you know that Parkinson's disease. And they retrospective analyzed their symptoms when they came up and develop a criteria what is more specific and sensitive in diagnosing Parkinson's disease. Their step one is they have to, these patients should have bradykinase and akinase or eikinase. You know what bradykinase and eikinase now means, I have showed you. So if that is there, there should be at least one of the following. That is called rigidity, rest tremor, and impaired postural stability, right? So if these with bradykinesia, at least one of these features are there, you can diagnose this patient as idiopathic Parkinson's disease. That is what I told. These uh, symptoms are independent and non-overlapping. So if a patient has bradykinesia, slowness of movements from which you did, and in at least one of the following features, the, the rigidity, the rest tremor, and impaired postural stability. When it comes to the impaired postural stability, you have to make sure you know the postural stability could be due to if the patient has visual problems, he couldn't have. So you have to exclude the other causes like visual, sensory neuropathies, any problem with vestibular system or cerebellar. If all are normal, then you account this patient as postural instability due to Parkinsonism. So that is very clear. So now you diagnose as Parkinson's. The next step is you have some exclusion criteria as I said. What are they? If the patient has a, usually basically these, all these signs are meaning there is a secondary cause. So if there is a step in stepwise progression, you know, if a patient has an injury, they can develop Parkinson's. So that you don't call it as idiopathic Parkinson's. If the patient has encephalitis, actually even now with the COVID, uh, the, the epidemic, some have found in UK, they have later has developed Parkinsonism features, right? So there are a lot of research going on. So if there are a secondary cause, you call don't call as idiopathic Parkinson's. This exclusion criteria is all I'm not going by. Uh, single one. So if you can see this list, so all these are features for secondary causes. If you can find this, if this any of these are present, you are not calling them as idiopathic. But mind you, all these has patient as Parkinsonism. So then comes the supportive criteria for idiopathic Parkinson's. What are the supportive criteria? Unilateral onset. The one of the most important thing I have to stress here: all these par idiopathic Parkinson's patient, their symptoms have initiated unilaterally. So in one side, right? The rest tremor is one of the thing. Progressive, you know, as you know, as I told, the the nigrostriatal cell loss is uh, with time. So because of that, the, there shouldn't be any stepwise progression. That means be steadily progressive. Even the patients develop into stage three or stage four, there should be a persistent asymmetry. That means one side should be the symptoms should be worse than the other. Especially the patient where the patient symptoms initiate that side is worse. That's what called persistent asymmetry. Worse on on the onset side. And other important features, these patients are very much responsive to levodopa, the commonest drug we use. Actually, we, there is a, uh, what I'm not going to discuss there, it's called levodopa challenge test, even what we, if you have suspicious of idiopathic Parkinson's, there is called a levodopa challenge test. That means you give, challenge a patient with a levodopa challenge, their symptoms markedly improve. So there is a very good levodopa response. Other side of the, when there is a levodopa response, they develop severe levodopa induced dyskinesia, like coriform movements, which I'll show you in a video later. And the other important thing, this is very slowly progressive condition because of that, there should be at least more than five years levodopa responsiveness because at a very later stage, maybe stage three or four, the patient levodopa response gradually declines. And the other important, they should have a disease cause of more than <clears throat> 10 years. So if these features are there, they are very suggestive of idiopathic Parkinson. So first step, we diagnose the Parkinson's with bradykinesia and any of the other features I told you, then you exclude secondary causes. Third step is give the supportive evidence. So there is another uh, the, the the diagnostic criteria that is UK uh, PDS criteria which I mentioned before. They mentioned this is very simple. If you want to don't want to the, the 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 recognize the previous one, this is very simple. They say six features. What are they? The 
tremoatrase, bradykinesia, rigidity, posture, the four which I mentioned already, and in addition, the freezing of gait and flex postures, which I already showed you in a video where the patient is walking, all this I showed you. The fifth and sixth, you called it as the motor blocks. These patients are suddenly, they walk, suddenly they block, that's called freezing, so the motor blocks. If, if these features are there, definite Parkinsonism, of the if out of these features, the patient has Parkinsonism, if all the features, if one should be tremor or bradykinesia. Then probable is there, as you can remember, as you can see, either out of the first four, they are either one of these following. So possible when the features uh, five or six. Then comes the staging of the disease. This is called the Hohen and HNY, it's in short term. I'm not going to discuss in uh, detail about this. What I want to show you when you start a diagnose a Parkinson's uh, patients, you can uh, put them onto a stage, staging system. That is called, this is very important when it comes to the rehabilitation. So it's starting from stage one to five. So simply the stage one is a very mild disease that is called symptoms is only present on one side. That is only unilateral, right? Then it comes when it comes, as you can see, stage three, which is called mild st mid stage. The symptoms appear on both sides as well as the axis, and but still, uh, the, the the patient's balance is mostly comp not comprom um, uh, compromised here. Stage five is very severe disease where the patient is completely wheelchair bound. So these are the stages. These are called Hoen and Yai, Chen Y staging, you can go Google and see if you want to have more details, which is most importantly for the when the patient, how the patient progresses the disease to stage. Then I told you there is a other thing called atypical Parkinsonian syndrome. There are four conditions we discuss under this one. The progressive supranuclear pulse is one. You know, PSD or previously called as Seal Richardson Alsbeck disease. The second thing is multiple system atrophy. The cortico basal syndrome or CBS, some call as CBD, also cortico basal degeneration, but the common good term, better term would be CBS. The fourth uh, atypical Parkinsonian, Parkinsonian syndrome is diffuse lower body disease. So, what these features? How do how these difference from the idiopathic Parkinson? These patients have a very rapid progression, early onset dementia and hallucinations. If a patient comes with Parkinsonism, which I told you the features, and they have very early onset dementia or hallucination, you have to always think about secondary Parkinson. It's not secondary, sorry, atypical Parkinsonian syndrome, especially if they come with these. That is what we call as a diffuse Lewy body disease. If they have hallucinations and dementia, you might be dealing with a patient with DLBD. Early onset of loss of balance, or your patient comes with frequent falls. There are two conditions you have to think about Parkinsonism coming with early onset loss of balance and falls, either PSP or multiple system atrophy because multiple. And the patient comes with features of cerebellar and uh, uh, the, the autonomic features, you have to always think of multiple system atrophy. And if the patient has upper motor neuron side, that means upgoing planters and other things, we have to think about the, the cortico basal syndrome and sometimes multiple system atrophy as well. So if the patient has a gaze palsy, specifically vertical gaze palsy, you have to always think of PSP in a patient, right? So these are features are more in favor of atypical Parkinson's. If the patient, mind you, all these patient has, if the parking idiopathic Parkinson's patient also has these features, but the important thing is these features doesn't appear in the early stage. They come at the later stage. In the, park, uh, the, the, the atypical Parkinsonian syndrome, all these progression is rapid, all these recurrent falls, they have cerebellar, autonomic, all these symptoms are very early stage of the disease. So now I have already discussed the first part of my talk, that is the how to diagnose. And I also told to you what are the commonest uh, causes as well, that is in four things I told you, that is idiopathic, Parkinsonian plus, secondary Parkinsonism and the hereto-degenerative. So I have given a uh, brief outline on them. So now we'll come to the management of Parkinson's disease. So when it comes to therapeutic, you all know the patient has to be started on treatment. So when it comes to therapeutic principles, there are four principles that we adhere. The first thing is always give priority to any therapies. It could be a drug, it could be surgery, it could be device that have been established as protective. What does it mean by protective? That should be that if that drug or surgery should able to slow down the disease progression. If you can remember, I already told you, unfortunately, at this moment, at this day, there are no, there are no such treatment that slows the progression of the disease. There are a lot of studies going on, study that completed, but there is no uh, statistically significant data to give a, protect, give, a, give a therapy. Maybe in the future, we might be having. 
Second thing is encourage patients to remain active and mobile. So in our setup, not like the Western and other settings, you know, when a patient has a, you know, we say the patient with Parkinson's may be very early stage. What happens in these patients, they go and Google and see what they say is the moment that is a cashier's case picture where the patients very later stage after 20 years, what happened to him and the, all the, uh, the, the friends, all the relatives gather and say, don't take, don't go, don't be, don't walk, be at home. And not. this is not the thing you see, you know, always if you diagnose uh, Parkinson's patient, especially mild to moderate, early mild to moderate disease, they should be encouraged, active and mobile as much as possible. That is very, very important. So that actually helps to patients. Mobility is much important. And the other thing is keep the patient functioning independent as long as possible. For an example, a patient with 54 years, right? So uh, the 54 years, if you diagnose, sometimes what the patient does, they try to retire on the next day, which shouldn't happen. So patient should be functioning independent as much as possible. Patient should not be functioning independently without support, only at the very latter stage of what we call as very advanced disease only. So keep in mind that keep you always stress the importance of functioning independent as long as possible. Final thing, the most important thing is there is no uh, the patient's treatment strategy should be individualized. For an example, you might be an executive banker, bank executive coming to you at the 50 years of age, and you diagnose very difficulty in writing or very slowness, sometimes very mild intermittent trouble, you diagnose as Parkinson's. And this patient's management should be different from patient who is in from Cavitigo lab, 50 year old farm, so wherever this patient needs and the patient's affordability, which I discussed in the view, is different. So you have to assess the patient's needs and treat individually. That means two patients can't manage uh, in the same manner. So their patient's needs must be different. Patient's affordability must be different. So all these have to con uh, consider when you are treating. So these are the four therapeutic principles. If there is any treatment, you have to treat that patient uh, with any agents available, which could be neuroprotective. Unfortunately, at this moment, there is nothing. Patient should be remain active and mobile. Th thirdly, patient should be functioning independently as long as possible. Finally, the therapy should, the patient's management should be individualized from the one to the other. And when it comes to management of PD, there are four major, three major areas you can manage. First thing is called non-pharmacological management, which is called the rehabilitation aspect, which I will give you show your video. The non-pharmacological method, very very important in today's context. Second thing is the pharmacological agents. This could be again divided into neuroprotective medications or agents or the symptomatic men. Unfortunately, you know that there is no neuroprotective agent so far, which is trial proven or which is called statistically proven. There are certain drugs they have proposed, but nothing is proven yet. So all medications we have at the moment are symptomatic. Third option is surgical option. There are you know, there are surgical options which you call functional neurosurgery as well as open neurosurgeries. Functional neurosurgery, you know that that is the most widely used at the moment, what's called deep brain stimulation surgery. It's not available in this country at the moment, right? So these are, so these are the three things, what non-pharmacological, pharmacological and surgical. So as you know, when it comes to the pharmacological uh, management, so what is the pathophysiology behind as you, if you can go back, the, somehow the dopamine releasing uh, the, uh, the, the cells has been depleted. Therefore, enough dopamine is not produced in the body. So that is the pathophysiology behind that. So somehow with whatever the treatment you do, you need to improve or you need to provide sufficient amount of liver dopa to the body. So what is the easiest? You give liver dopa as outside. That is called liver dopa replaces dopamine. So all the more, that is the most important medication we use at the moment called L-dopa or liver dopa. That is the, uh, the, the, the most important and the most effective medication. Other one, you know, the liver dopa is broken down in the body by what we call as catechol o transfer is COMPT. So if you can give an inhibitor for that, COMPT inhibitor, so you can preserve the liver dopa, either with the, the, the drug that you are giving or whatever the existing liver dopa in the body, you can, so that's another class of drug, what we call COMPT inhibitors. Then there are certain drugs, what we call as dopamine agonists, that's called, it mimics dopamine, it acts like dopamine, so what we call as dopamine agonist, broadly we call DA. So the other one is there are certain things called Mao B inhibitors, you know, Mao B is some uh, selegiline and resigiline. Uh, preserves existing dopamine. That's why there are a lot of research is going on whether these Mao inhibitors can be used as a neuroprotective agent. Unfortunately, studies has not given enough 
enough or sufficient data on that aspect. So if the other class of drugs is mau B inhibitors, so they, that uh, preserves whatever the existing, so thereby they can theoretically they should be able to prolong or uh, slow down the disease progression. So these are the the the, the therapeutic principles or pharmacotherapy principles. You can replace developer or you can uh, give an agent which reduces breakdown of the already available liver dopa or can you give a dopamine agonist which acts like dopamine or uh, increase by uh, whatever the existing uh, dopamine would be preserved by what we call mao b inhibitors so these are the the, the therapeutic choices available i'm not going to detail this table shows all the drugs which are available the dopamine precursors which is called the liver dopa you know this is when you give a liver dopa it's been broken down in by dopa decarboxylase you have to give a dopa decarboxy inhibitor with liver dopa that's why it comes as benzeticide or carbidopa so there are a lot of formulation intermediate release continuous release disorderable mouth so lot of so i'm not going to detail discuss detail on this one these are the drugs available which are given to uh, comes under the categories which i showed in the previous ones So the important is what medications start. As you showed, there are about 10 groups or 10 classes of medications start. So what should guide the patients uh, to decision uh, to, to, to you, you to make the decision whether which one is started? There are things, many factors, not even single factor. There are many factors which should be helping determine the choice of medication. So one of the important things, age and overall health of the patient. So simply what I am saying, if you are coming across a patient with 45 years old and another patient with the, the 65 year old, your management, the, the mitigation you are going to start is different. I'll say why, right? So age and overall, if the patient is very active patient, even at 65, you might consider some other medication than a patient who is diagnosed as Parkinson's, which is maybe not mobile as much as maybe because of various factors. So age and overall health of the patient is very important. So the second thing is, most of these medications, especially the, the, the most effective medication, liver dopa, has motor side defects. So what we call as in long-term use, they develop motor complications. You have to be very careful about development of motor complications. Third thing is the other comorbidities associated, associated with Parkinson's patient. And because you know the majority of these patients are elderly, because you have to consider other comorbidities patients we might have, like dementia, the orthostatic hypertension, sleep disturbance, etc. Finally, in this country, the other most important factor you have to consider is the cost of the medication. For example, if you need to start a patient with selegiline initials, it's a tablet is around 300 in this country. But fortunately, the liver dopa preparations and some of the dopamine agonists are available in our system, in our uh, the, the, the public health system, so you can give it. But in certain patients, if you want even to start, uh, some medications which are expensive, you might not be able to find it. That's what I told, always individualize the therapy. So cost of the medications also factor we need to start. So this is the very dreadful complication I told uh, as a result of liver dopa. This is a patient with liver dopa induced dyskinesia, severe chorea. Generalized, most of the time the patient, this patient is on this movement because of the, so sometimes the patient prefer not to have any medications to prevent this complication. Okay, so this is what we call dyskinesia, generalized coriform movements due to liver dopa. So, right, so these are symptomatic. I'll come to the symptomatic treatment of in early disease. So this is very important. Early disease is very mild disease, maybe unilateral involvement. So patients and in these patients, sometimes patients do not necessarily need treatment. You can discuss the condition with the patient. For an example, if you have a banker comes to you, he says, I'm little slow. Or the patient might, might say, I have a very mild tremor, which is intermittent. When I get stressed up or something like that, I get the bill. So you can discuss with the patient and you can delay starting initiating of treatment because their work or quality of light is not affected. So patients do not necessarily need treatment at the initial stages, but you have to convey that message to the patient. We'll wait for another six months or one year, we'll review in about three to six months and we'll discuss whether you need to start. Because as you, I mentioned, all the medications which I mentioned are symptomatic only. Because sometimes if it comes to the, you have to remind the fact early treatment, there's a better job in maintaining quality of light than the, 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 the improving the patient's the, the, the disease 
modification. So you have to give that option. If the patient has a tremor, it's very troubling, but patient can manage this vector. You have to you can say that this, there are certain medications which you can improve your quality of life. So give that option to the patient. So many factors, as you mentioned, in the uh, help in designing and initiation of symptomatic treatment in the early days. What are they? They should be improve the quality of life. The patient is slowness. Patient can't put a signature on the the, the check or the care can write. Then the should are cleared up of this patient. Their symptoms may improve. So thereby the quality of life might improve. And need to ability of the continuing medication. That's what I told initially. The patient should not stop work. The patient should continue on his working. Therefore, the drugs might help. And disability could be reduced more obviously. Finally, the patient's attitude towards medication is also very important. So when it comes to early symptomatic treatment, as I mentioned, liver dopa is the most effective symptomatic treatment. So, but the issue what I mentioned is when it on long term use, when you use it for many years, maybe two to three years time, they develop very dreadful motor complications, which, which I showed you before, what we call as dyskinesia. So mind you, the patient comes with the 45 year old, old so if you want to start liver dopa you have might have to use this drug for another 15 to 20 years in this patient so you have to be little careful maybe the patient five years time coming very severe dyskinesia because of that you might delay initiating these patients younger patients delay initiating the, uh, the, the dopamine but if a patient is 65 years old 75 years old Oh, sorry, 70 years old. If the patients, maybe you think the patient might go with the disease in about five to six years, you have to improve the quality of life to the maximum. So in those patients, you straight away might start liver dopa. So the other group of drugs, the second commonest or the second most effective drug is the dopamine agonist. There are two groups uh, the, the, in Sri Lanka at the moment. One thing is propinidol, the other one is pramipoxol. The issue with these two drugs are they are less effective than liver dopa, but the issue with these drugs are they have a lot of side effects mainly the they have effect the cognitive effects they have sometimes hallucinations uh, that because of that it is not good for uh, all the patients but is very good as an initiation therapy mild to moderate disease in young patients So what are the again the initial treatment considered? I'm putting a cartoon here. If there are three uh, scenarios, if a patient comes with young age, for an example, may just be 45 to 50. So minimize long-term dyskinesia risk. So what you need to start a dopamine agonist. That's what I told previously. You can start a small dose of primepixol or opinrol and step up as the patient needs. Second is an older patient, maybe 65 to 70 years old patient. So the patients, you have to minimize cognitive effect because you know the dopamine agonists are more prone to cause the, the cognitive effects. Therefore, you without starting dopamine agonists, you straight away in these patients start liver dopa. Finally, patients with very mild symptoms, as you know, they suggest at the moment no need of a dopaminergic medication. That means neither liver dopa preparation, no dopamine agonists. In these conditions, you can start amantadinoma or binibidase. Sometimes they might help you to prolong the, uh, the disease uh, slow, the, 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 they can stop the disease progression to a certain extent, though there are not enough evidence for so these patients. So the, always these patients should be followed up. So these are three clinical scenarios. So now I'm coming to the latter stage again. Now do you think this, just go through the video I showed you before and see whether this patient has Parkinson's. As you clearly see the patient as bradykinesia. So the issue I told, put that video, this patient doesn't have the characteristic tremor, but still this patient has bradykinesia, this patient has, and it is asymmetrical less. So this patient has idiopathy Parkinson's disease. So if you thought patient has Parkinson's, you're good. If not, at the end of the talk, if you think that now the patient, I am confident that patient has Parkinson's, I think I have full my, fulfilled my objective. Yeah, you can very clearly say there is slowness of the movement, especially on the right, asymmetrical. So this is a patient with mild to moderate disease or early to, sorry, early to mild disease of Parkinson's, idiopathic Parkinson's. Now I'm going to show you a video here, which was very recently put in the NEJM. As I mentioned you, the pharmacological treatment. So you know, when the pharmacological treatment is started, with the disease progress, when the patient goes about 10 to 15 years, the drugs doesn't work for various things, which I'm not going to discuss, I told you. So these patients, the rehabilitation of what we call physical therapy is very much important. See, this is a study they done in uh, states, which showed the paddling, 
continuous paddling how the patient's parkinson's has improved So you can see this patient has severe Parkinson's and shuffling, freezing of gait. Come to the parking lot, and off he went. So see how this patient perfectly, even executing a U-turn. This gives Parkinson's patients throughout the world reason to be optimistic. But how can you go from this one minute to this the next? Dr. Jay Albert's been studying the effects of pedaling on Parkinson's after his own amazing discovery. Albert, an avid cyclist, went on a 50-mile tandem bike ride with a friend who had Parkinson's. In this video shot before the ride, his friend's hand shook wildly, but afterwards, steady. So Albert started a trial at the Cleveland Clinic. Parkinson's patients pushed to pedal hard. Ten minutes a little harder, I'll get your heart rate up. The result? an improvement in motor functions that lasted for weeks. I haven't had any meds yet today, and I was shaking pretty good. But this exercise, it's amazing. Researchers still don't know why it works. One theory, pedaling releases chemicals that improves motor function. The same theory behind this. Parkinson's patients able to dance. This is a transporting exercise. Uh, when I come here, I don't have Parkinson's. For patients, intriguing mysteries that could put a new spin on treating their disease. Sharon Alfonsi, ABC News, New York. So what actually they showed in these studies with physical therapy, so how the patient, especially with the advanced Parkinson's, can improve with physical therapy. So this is what I put this video is, you know, most of our units, neurology units, most of in our hospitals, they have a physios, occupational therapist, and all the therapists which we can have a successful uh, rehabilitation program, which could be do, do wonders. The pathophysiology behind what they explain is in our system, in our brain, there are a lot of tracks which have not been used so far you know there are thousands and thousands of tracks in the brain which has been dormant for a long time by changing for certain things like cycling group dancing group therapies you can activate the uh, the, the system certain tracks which were not functioning before by releasing certain chemicals a lot of research has been going on on this one very promising at the moment as you have shown in this video so probably uh, in a country like ours where the the, the limit resources are limited like for deep brain stimulation or other things this might be a very important oh, yeah, no, okay so finally i'm going to come into the end of my talks so what are the take-home messages i want to give you parkinson is very common do you, if you the issue is you don't diagnose early and importantly i want to mention this idiopathic parkinson disease is the commonest unfortunately it's very underdiagnosed especially at the early and mild disease. There is no point in a diagnosing a patient. After five years of illness, any person could diagnose a very severe tremor. The important of this talk, I told you, I told you the very important clinical features which you can diagnose Parkinson's. As you now know, there is no need of any investigation. This is entirely clinical. So there is no, at the moment, there is no medication which had been proven neuroprotective. All the medications which are available are symptomatic. So out of the medications, the liver dopa remains a main pharmacological, pharmacological agent, but dopamine agonists are important, have an important role in the management, especially at an early stage of the disease and a patient with younger age. The almost the most important manager, the one important message I want to give is should be individualized. The management should be individualized and patient-centered, considering various factors which I mentioned. So if you have any questions, you can, I think if the chat we can have a thing. Otherwise, you can drop me an email, right? So I can respond. Thank you very much for your patience hearing. Once again, I should thank all the organizers of this GMO, uh, GMO and the Sri organization for giving me this opportunity. It's a wonderful thing, and I wish all the very best for their future endeavors as well, right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, really informative presentation. And uh, it's uh, time for a few queries, sir. Uh, please write your question in the chat box. Uh. So we have a question from a participant. How can we manage motor complications in Parkinsonism? 
Yeah, I actually, this is a very good question. I didn't touch on that because another entire topic. When it comes to motor complication, there are a lot of complications. For example, there are three main complications. One thing is called uh, wearing off effect. Wearing off effect means simply <laughs> if a patient's uh, the effect of the drugs wears off in the the next dose. For an, I'll give an example. If a patient takes a drug in the seven thirty seven in the morning, then next dose is at we'll say at one o'clock one p.m. So by around eleven o'clock, the patient symptoms the tremor reappears, the bradykinesia gets worse, which we call as a wearing off. So what you need to do, you have to increase the amount of drugs. If you are giving a quarter tablet of levodopa, you can increase to half. The other option is you can increase the frequency instead of every six hours you can give every four hours second thing is sometimes this is what we call as uh, wearing off or predictable loss some patients have unpredictable loss sometimes you can't say when the patient gets the off periods it's very difficult so you have to ask the patient to maintain a diary and a lot of things can be done you can add a dopamine agonist you can add a continuous release preparation a lot of things and the other complication is the dyskinesia motor complication which i told when it comes to dyskinesia is also very important there are two ty three types of dyskinesia one thing is what we call call as end of this dyskinesia that means again if the patient's take the sindopa whatever the amount of at the morning or seven in the morning the next tablet is due at uh, we'll say 12 o'clock the patients develop severe dyskinesia by around 11 o'clock with one hour to next hour this is called end of dose dyskinesia so this the, this should be managed you have to again increase the dose or uh, give some other things which improve increases the amount of levodopa in the body the good thing is you can add entacapone which is called a corticatecol or methyl transfer inhibitor the other dreadful thing is called peak dose dyskinesia peak dose is when you take the drug within about 45 half an hour to 45 minutes patient severe develop severe dyskinesia and uh, it lasts for about 45 minutes one hour so this is managed completely different to the end of dose dyskinesia you have to reduce the dose at that time so that's why very important to identify which motor complication you are dealing with right so that's how it goes you have to see what motor complication the patient has and then uh, adjust the medications you might have to change the medication uh, so there are a lot of options right so those that's how you can manage each and if you have specifically one this motor complication you have answer these are a broader thing right okay Thank you very much, sir. That was a clear-cut explanation. So please bear with us. Uh, we have a few more queries from the particip participants. Uh, the next question is, uh, how long it will take to develop Parkinson's dementia? Yes, uh, usually that is, that is the very important. As I told you, the, if you diagnose very early at the very motor within first year, now they have realized it takes a minimum of eight to ten years to develop some sort of a dementia this called dementia is uh, the, the I, I hope he she or he is referring to parkinson's disease dementia you know most of these patients are old elderly patients so they have some degree of dementia as well so what is the important thing is to diagnose whether this patient has parkinson's disease dementia or the normal uh, the, the dementia due to the normal aging or sometimes they might have alzheimer's dementia as well so the important thing is the, if you want a clear cut idea, it is not early. So, if you come, the Parkinson's disease dementia is usually late, maybe after minimum of uh, 10 years, I would say, that is a later stage, right? providing that the patient was diagnosed at the early stage. Thank you very much, sir. One more query. What is the place for benzexol in treating Parkinson's disease? Yeah, good question. So benzexol, that is we commonly use as artane. In my experience, or in my experience, that is very much useful for patients with to alleviate or to good response for tremor. That doesn't help much for bradykinesia or rigidity. If a patient comes, he saw a main symptom is bradykinesia, the tremor, even you don't need to start levodopa on these patients. Artane might help. So R10 is mainly a symptomatic treatment, I would say, for tremor. So tr what is there is another form of, uh, in another classification, you can tremor dominant Parkinsonism. In such patients, uh, benzexol is very useful. You have to start very slow doses and, imp and increase gradually with uh, looking for the response of the patient. So mainly to alleviate tremor, I would say. Thank you, sir. Uh, the last question is, so what's the maximum daily dose of levodopa? 
uh, there is nothing like that. There is no not maximum doses. Actually, I have been using uh, half a tablet or one one tablet per patient every two hourly. That means about sometimes about eight to ten tablet. There is nothing the patient can tolerate. You can go for the maximum provided that it doesn't cause us dreadful side effects as you, as I mentioned the uh, the dyskinesia you shown to you right. The important issue is as the disease in, uh, increases or the severity gets worse, maybe the stage three or four disease the the the, the impact or the benefit of levodopa reduces right especially they don't absorb as well in the early stage like like the early stage so their benefit is much less rather than they having causing a benefit to the patient they cause a lot of side effects then sometimes it might not be useful in other countries what they say use is what we call as apomine infusion which we call as the the theory behind this we call continuous dopamine stimulation of the body right so various the the, the, the oral or what the, the way we take it has a lot of effects on the continuous dopamine stimulation. So the question for your answer is, there is no upper limit. As far as patient can tolerate, you can continue up to whatever the dose, provided that there is no dreadful side effects. Thank you, sir. A few more queries we have got from the participants. Uh, next question is, so when should we refer the patient to neurologist with the features of Parkinson's? My, 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 uh, urge or what i urge as much as as earliest as possible the important thing is as i mentioned there are a lot of principles there are a lot of medications so you have to discuss with the patient what their needs you any person can uh, continue the medication but when you come across a patient with uh, the, the parkinson's please refer them as early as possible why i am saying so if you start treatment their quality of life if they come to the early stage of the disease their quality of life can be surprisingly can become to normal as a normal person especially within the first five years the important thing is you have to read the correct doses i've seen a lot of prescriptions hot a tablet given twice daily for years and years no point you have to give adequate doses where the patient's symptoms are improving so sometimes that is that decision has to be taken by a neurologist in other countries actually if the neurologist doesn't see they have movement disorder species what we call as but it's far away from us the most important thing is to refer as soon as soon as possible then you can follow up and probably then periodically maybe every six months every one year depending on the patient's uh, condition uh, thank you very much sir uh, one more query from the participant uh, once this kinesia appeared as a side effect can it be reversed Yes, yes, it can be reversed, it can be controlled, right? I would say it controlled. For an example, as I mentioned, if the dyskinesia is to developer, right? The levodopa is due to the levodopa preparation. As I mentioned, if the levodopa, uh, the dyskinesia is a peak dose, you might have to reduce the doses, then you can disappear. If the patient's uh, dyskinesia is end of dose, you have to increase. Sometimes it comes in a late stage, what we call as biphasic or very difficult, unpredictable loss, very difficult control with the alteration of the levodopa doses at that time there are what there are a lot of medication not not actually two or three medications which completely targeting at alleviating or managing uh, dyskinesia one of the medication is clonazepam clonazepam is very useful in getting rid of reducing the the dyskinesia but at the, at, at the expense of drowsiness amantadine which has been used as an antiviral is a very good anti-dyskinetic medication unfortunately it's not available in our system it's very expensive a tablet is around 150 rupees so some patients who can afford can go ahead not reversed i would say it can be controlled Thank you, sir. Uh, I think the final question is, uh, is there a place for MRI and what are the changes we will see? Uh, yes, uh, there is a place. But I, what I mentioned is, if you are quite comfortable, if you are quite confident of Parkinson's, you don't need to uh, ha have any form of imaging to diagnose. But we would say the patient comes with a tremor and the patient doesn't fit completely into the, 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 the diagnostic criteria I mentioned. Sometimes it is important, right, which you have to rule out. But if someone asks for diagnosis of idiopathic Parkinson's, no, right? But when it comes to the atypical Parkinsonism, like corticobasal degeneration, PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy, definitely there is a place because PSP has certain changes which are very much specific for, for an example, what we call as uh, midbrain atrophy, right? Uh, the, the, uh, 
midbrain atrophy can have certain clinical features you do the bird's beak appearance right so there are uh, in a in a, you know in a msa patient multiple system atrophy they it called hot cross bond sign a lot of things are there but it, that is for atypical parkinson's but for if i give a very short answer for diagnosis of parkinsonism no but when it comes to etiology yes so that is the simple answer for idiopathic parkinson disease uh, mri is not helpful Thank you very much, sir. That's all the queries now. Uh, thank you very much again for your excellent presentation. It was really informative and really interesting presentation. And I would like to thank on behalf of GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. Also, we would like to present a small talk and appreciation to you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, and, Sinta. Uh, it was a pleasure. Right. Thank you, sir. And for the participants, uh, please follow the link in the chat box to receive your participation certificate. And uh, that's the end of the webinar today. Thank you all for your participation. And I'm Dr. Sinta signing off here. Thank you.